So good morning and welcome to our Roberts Library Archive Talk today. I think you all know Ms. Jill Botticelli. She is our archivist and special collections librarian. She is a certified archivist, if any of you uh, wondered uh, what that is. She can tell you what it means, and, but we're privileged to have uh, someone with her uh, qualifications today. And of course, she's going to talk about the missionary school that's here, was here, and the history behind it. And we're going to turn it on over to Jill so we can have the maximum amount of time for her presentation. Thank you. Glad everyone um, is joining us this morning. Let's see. I'm going to get my timer going so that I can try to keep on time. Um, Okay, so um, we're going to talk today about uh, the history of the Baptist Women's Missionary Training School. Kind of a mouthful. Um, and our story starts um, with Robert Cook Buckner. So you may be familiar with the Buckner Children's Home in Dallas. And Dr. Buckner was the founder. And... Um, in 1904, Dr. Buckner discovered that there were four girls that were in the orphan's home that wanted to follow in Lottie Moon's footsteps and do mis missionary work. And so Dr. Buckner was um, thinking about these girls and he was on the way to a pastor's conference in Dallas. And while he was uh, in his carriage uh, going to the conference, he, he began, began to think about what he could do for these girls, and he calculated a plan for missionary training school. And he actually didn't waste any time. As soon When he got to the pastor's conference, he just um, presented it to the Dallas Baptist pastors and said, hey, can you guys get on board with this? And um, fortunately for these four young ladies, the Dallas pastors, as well as the Baptist women mission workers of Texas, um, loved the idea and they um, started a training school. Oops, I thought I was moving on. Second, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, so on September 15th, 1906, two years later, the school officially opened and it was held in an annex building of the orphan's home. And there was no other school like this in the South. Dr. Buckner believed that women, though not ordained preachers, must be recognized as workers in all gospel work and must be made efficient. And he said that that remained the great pillar, the great foundation pillar of the training school. So to organize a school, um, a board was formed and uh, they oversaw the work and they wrote some resolutions and they wrote a constitution for the training school. They articulated the purpose of the training school by stating, the object of this institution is the training of women for missionary work. This training embraces a knowledge of the scriptures, of personal work in leading souls to Christ and higher planes of living, something of the structure of the body, laws of health, care for the sick, in sort, the training necessary to soul winning and intelligent Christian homemaking. So as well as um, a board and governing, um, the school would need leadership. And the first superintendent of the training school was Mrs. M.J. Nelson. And she came from Dallas to Dallas from Corsicana where she was a city missionary. And with the help of Dr. Buckner, they put together a program for the girls. The classes were taught by local pastors and their wives and included these that are listed. And you can see from this list that it was a demanding theological workload. Um, there were some heavy classes here, um, systematic study, practical theology. Um, you can also see that um, you can notice that some of the teachers were prominent Baptist pastors like George W. Truett and J. Frank Norris. So they had some good teachers. Um, the school, uh, the girls attended the school tuition free, but there was a $5 matriculation fee and they were expected to contribute to the running of the household, both monetarily and physically. Domestic training was provided through the daily operations of the facility. So in case you're interested, uh, the list of items to bring with them were four sheets, four pillowcases, six towels, covers and spread for the bed, and toilet articles. So they were set. Um, an early student of the training school in Dow Dallas was Ida Bowie Taylor. Ida was a pastor's daughter from Mississippi. 
Her family moved to Texas when she was a girl, and after attending Blue Mountain College in Mississippi, she returned to Texas to teach in the public school system. Ida attended the missionary training school for one year and then was appointed to the mission field of China in 1905. When Ida arrived in Chifu, China, she had no knowledge of the language, but she did have an eagerness to do the work and that allowed her to, to adapt well. So here's the missionary training school's connection to Lottie Moon. Um, Ida worked with Lottie Moon, and she actually took over from Lottie um, the direction of a girls' school that had about 50 students. Unfortunately, Ida contracted three different strains of smallpox all at the same time, and um, Lottie actually nursed her uh, back to health, but she never made a full recovery, and she, she continued to work in China until 1924, and she returned to the States due to ill health. So since uh, young ladies continued to show an interest in the training school, it soon became apparent that a permanent home was needed. Southwestern at this time was still at Baylor, um, but they'd already made a reputation for educating women. So when the seminary moved to Fort Worth, it just seemed logical to merge the two. So uh, Dr. Buckner approached L.R. Scarborough and they no negotiated the transfer of the training school to Southwestern in 1909. As I mentioned, women's education was important to the founders of our institution and it was actually included in our 1908 charter. So when the campus opened in October 1911, the training school girls were part of that first class in Fort Worth. For the first six weeks, the 12 charter members of the training school lived and studied in the home of Reverend J.M.P. Morrow. And that's because Fort Worth Hall was not complete um, and they didn't have anywhere to live. So um, he served as the field secretary for the seminary and lived across the street from Fort Worth Hall on Baradas. Um, once the second floor of Fort Worth Hall was finished, the girls moved in. The second floor housed the married couples at one end and the single ladies at the other. And the area where the single ladies were housed was called no man's land. <laughs> so um, there was no official principal of the school at the time. So the ladies as well as the men were supervised by the superintendents of Fort Worth Hall. For the first year, this was Mrs. Mary Newman. She was the wife of A.H. Newman. And then uh, Minnie Wells Cheek. And she, Mrs. Cheek came to the seminary with her small daughter after the death of her husband. And both women provided a supportive environment and helped with the domestic science training. In 1912, six ladies graduated from the missionary training school. Um, this was the fifth graduation of the seminary and the first graduation at the new location. As part of the graduation ceremony um, it, that was held separately from the seminary students, Mrs. Cora Whiteley read a paper titled Women's Work in the Kingdom. So they had their own graduation and um, it was a, an exciting time for the, for the training school. Through its history, the missionary training school was blessed to be led by the most outstanding Texas Baptist women. This started in 1913 with the school's first principal at Fort Worth, Miss Mary C. Tupper. And as hard as I tried, Trust me, I tried. I could not find a picture of this woman. It's incredible that we found so many things about Mary Tupper and no pictures. So, um, but Mary Tupper came from Southern Baptist royalty. Her father was Henry Allen Tupper, the corresponding secretary for the Foreign Mission Board, and her mother was a Boyce. She was the niece of J.P. Boyce, the founder and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Prior to coming to Fort Worth, Miss Tupper served as a missionary in Mexico for a short time, but she was ill and unable to continue there. And Dr. Scarborough described her as one of the most cultured, refined, consecrated missionary personalities in all the land. Um, she was very determined to establish the best possible training center. And so prior to her arrival, she spent time visiting other training schools and she modeled the curriculum after the Baptist Missionary Training School of Chicago. This school had established itself as a premier training center and it was started in 1881. As a foundation, God's word was the chief textbook. 
social service was stressed, and music was taught as a way to open evangelistic doors. Miss Tupper was fo followed by Alma Lyle. She was a graduate of the training school, and she led the school through the trying days of World War I. She left in 1919 when she married Texas Baptist and Baylor professor J.B. Tidwell. Mrs. Lyle was at the helm of the training school as it transitioned into its own building. So it became apparent from the beginning that the school needed its own building. Uh, and this could not have been accomplished without the help of Texas Baptist women. Dr. Scarborough called on their assistance with the overwhelming task of raising money for a new building on the campus of Southwestern Seminary. This would be the second building on Seminary Hill. And it's now known as Barnard Hall. Anybody live or have lived in Barnard Hall? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, we um, see Dr. Scarborough secured Mrs. R. F. Stokes uh, as field secretary for the training school to help raise money among Texas Baptist women, and she proved to be vital in the process of ensuring the final product. In 1913, on opening day of the seminary school year, there was a dirt breaking ceremony. And I found this interesting that it wasn't called groundbreaking, it was dirt breaking. And they didn't break the dirt with a um, shovel, they actually planned to, to plow a furrow in the ground. And um, unfortunately it rained that day and they were unable to um, plow their furrow, but they, ha they did have um, some addresses by Dr. Scarborough and Buckner and Mrs. Stokes and Miss Tupper. And then construction started immediately on the building. Almost all the money had been raised when an unexpected gift from the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention um, arrived. They gave a whopping $10,000. So in 1915, the seminary had the whole $100,000 that was needed for, to finish the construction of this building. In addition to the new building, um, Texas Baptist women also um, provided scholarships so that the young ladies could go to the training school tuition free. And um, as we know, this building still stands today as a great testament to the generous heart of Texas Baptist. Opening day for the new missionary training school was um, September 23, 1915. There were around a thousand people present at the dedication, and again, Dr. Buckner was invited to be part of the ceremony. Um, also in attendance was Dr. George Truitt, who was called upon for an impromptu speech. Um, Texas women, such as Mrs. Beddoe, Mrs. Cooper, and Mrs. Davis, all prominent um, WMU women, also contributed to the program. So I just, uh, I just imagine how much pride they should have, they would have felt when they opened this building that um, they had prayed over and had given so sacrificially um, to have. And it was really um, a magnificent building for its time. It was described as a most up-to-date, three-story and completely fireproof building that contains every provision to carry on the work. And the building accommodated 120 ladies. After the dedication, 112 moved in. So almost, we were almost to capacity. Um, reports of the opening in the newspaper, the ba Baptist Standard, portrayed the new, built, new home as tastefully decorated with all new furnishings and stated, on the, first, on the second floor were perhaps 30 rooms. Some hold two girls, some more, a few single rooms. Each is an outside room with windows or glass doors opening to concrete patios. They are charmingly furnished in shining white and have a closet for each girl's belongings. The rooms are delightful without any occupant, but when the girls come in and add to the pretty scene, her college pennants and cushions and the pictures of her home folks, you have a little palace on home wherein one may rest and visit and invite one soul. This sounds like a nice place to live. So has anyone ever picked up pecans on the campus? How many of you have picked up pecans? <laughs> um, you can thank Lucinda Williams for that. She was lovingly referred to as Mother Williams, and she took on the task of camp beautification. She can be credited with planning some of the landscaping that remains to this day. 
Dr. Scarborough even referred to her as Mother Williams DD, Doctor of Decoration. When she came to, some, to the seminary, Fort Worth Hall was, just, was the only building, and standing next to it was one tree. If you can imagine that, our campus with one tree. Um, Lucinda and her husband, Colonel W.L. Williams, were part of the group that founded First Baptist Dallas. They were charter members. She was very involved in the WMU, and in fact, she, is, she attended the historic meeting of Southern Baptist women at Richmond, Virginia in 1888 when the Women's Missionary Union was formed. She was named president of the WMU of Texas, and she was also a, an early supporter of the training school. In fact, she gave the first thousand dollars for the building. Um, she had no idea at that time that it would end up being her home. Um, and if all of these things weren't enough, Mrs. Williams also traveled Texas with Annie Armstrong. So we have a connection to Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon. <laughs> um, after a series of tragic losses, including her husband, the Colonel, Lucinda was invited to, by Miss Tupper and Dr. Scarborough to make a home at the training school. In 1914, at the age of 70, she moved to the campus. The sole reason for the invitation was that Dr. Scarborough and Ms. Tupper understood the important mentoring role that she could play in the lives of young training school students. I found a quote where Mother Williams um, was speaking regarding women and she said, I have always believed in women's independence, but also in their womanliness. I think God endowed men and women alike intelligence and they should walk side by side in all things. <coughs> So additional leaders to the training school include Agnes Byers and Ray McGarity, both of whom were heavily involved in Texas WMU before taking on leadership at the seminary. Mrs. Byers worked as the state juvenile leader and a Sunbeam leader. And Mrs., uh, it was under her leadership that the training school had its highest enrollment of over 310 students. Mrs. McGarity was a pastor's wife and one-time registrar at Baylor, and she was the chairman of the education committee of the WMU. Both women worked tirelessly to provide an effective training program through years of financial hardship. So what was life like for a student at the training school? The typical schedule was reported to the Baptist Standard by Mrs. Lyle. She said, our training day, our training school may be compared to a hive of busy bees. From the first sound of the rising bell at 6.30 till late at night, they go cheerfully about their many tasks. From 8 a.m. Tuesday till 5 p.m. Friday, they have their regular studies, practice, music, oratory, etc. Saturday is given to visiting on their various fields. Sunday, they work in the churches where they have been appointed to do special church work. Monday is their cleanup, laundry, and mending day. On Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, our training school women gather in their cozy, own cozy parlor for a little prayer service and field report. Daily exercise and the fresh air is required. Every care is taken to ensure a sound mind and spirit in a sound body. Regular meals, stud, rest, study, and recreation hours make for efficient physical living. We also found on a lot of the promotional items for this, the training school um, that they uh, had their own training school hymn, Our Home on a Hill. That's um, where I got the title for this um, talk from. So we looked and looked. We, we had the words, but we could not find the sheet music. And we looked and looked just everywhere trying to find the sheet music. And we finally just gave up and said, we don't have it. We're, we're just not going to be able to find it. And wouldn't you know, I opened a random folder and inside was the sheet music for Our Home on Hill. And, um, we, and I also found that was composed by another one of our notable faculty members, B.B. McKinney. So I asked Dr. Reynolds if he would sing the um, training school song for us. So he's going to do that. <laughs> There's a hill in Texas and it keeps by the sun. Every morn as he wakens the day, where the last beams of evening ever the night is begun, our long guest in fading away. Oh, sing of our home. 
In addition to their academic work, students were required to participate in practical work. In 1914, a Goodwill Center was established in an impoverished area of North Fort Worth. The students ran a kindergarten and a dormitory for working and shop girls. In the dormitory, the boarders were taught the Bible and were provided a good Christian home and religious environment. Additionally, the students visited homes in the area, providing food, clothing, medical assistance, and support as they were able. In other areas of practical work, the ladies joined the male seminary students to hold services in the city jail, county homes, a Mexican mission, and on the streets of Fort Worth. The seminary was three miles from downtown Fort Worth, and then um, beyond that was their, uh, the Goodwill Center. So the girls would catch multiple buses to make the journey, and it was long and inconvenient. In 1915, a plea was sent out to purchase a car for the training school. One of the Texas WMU ladies reported in the Baptist Standard that First Baptist Dallas gave $75 to the training school auto fund, and if only six more churches would give, they would have the money to purchase a car. She added, it's only a Ford, the cheapest machine they are asking for. <laughs> On the campus, their practical work included shifts at the campus kindergarten. This addition was the brainchild of Dr. Scarborough. He wanted to provide a kindergarten to allow seminary wives to attend classes. Mrs. Johnson, one of the uh, superintendents, lovingly referred to the kindergarten as Dr. Scarborough's orchestra. Another glimpse of seminary life comes from B. Coleman, a 1914 graduate. She came with her husband to the seminary and she shared these memories and I'm just going to read what she wrote. The first time we met, the first time we met here, most of the crowd gathered on the west side. They were looking at the moon and the stars laughing and talking. A small group of women, both married and single, stood together in the northeast corner. Perhaps there was some gossip, but nothing that was detrimental to character. One would ask a question and anyone who knew the answer would reply. Who is that red-headed man over there? He came from the mountains of East Tennessee, and when he came, he brought all his worldly possessions in a flour sack. Well, who is that nice-looking fellow walking around with his mother? Oh, I know him. He teaches baby Greek and goes to sleep in church. Well, I like his looks. I would enjoy teaching him the verb to love. <laughs> Hands off, young lady. He is soon to be married to a girl in Kentucky. Now that couple that are laughing and talking so much, who are they? They are from Baylor University. When they came, they, they brought their pet chicken in a luncheon basket covered with a bath towel. Was the chicken fried or alive? Very much alive, honey child. If you will cock your ear outside your west win window, you will hear him crow every morning. The Bible women say tradition tells us that the big fisherman fell on his knees and prayed every time he heard a rooster crow. And he preached such a powerful, powerful sermon that 3,000 people were converted. Who is that girl that is having such a big time? We call her May. Well, I have heard that she is making love to that slim young preacher that is following her around. That, uh, that man that says all hail when he means good morning, where is he from? He hails from England and he's making eyes to our elocution teacher. I understand that her small brother is opposed to his big sister marrying a dumb foreigner. I am from the north, said a woman in a naval tone. My father was born and reared way beyond the Mason-Dixon line. And my father, said a little woman from Kentucky, was, grown was a grown man before he heard someone say, it may be that damn Yankees is two words. A sweet woman said, when the loved disciple was nearly 100 years of age, his friends would haul him about in a little red wagon. Then John would hold up his hands to the large crowds of men and women, boys and girls, and say, little children, love one another, my children. The women bowed their heads, and silently they went through the small door to the chapel, and there they had a little prayer meeting before going to their rooms. Well, the Depression years of the 30s proved to be a very hard time for the seminary. Some referred to the campus during that time as Poverty Hill, and that's not far from the truth. One of the changes during this time was the necessity of closing the dining room and kitchen in the training school and merging food services with Fort Worth Hall. It was disappointing to the students. 
However, every area of campus life was required to sacrifice in an effort to keep everything running. This included the training school girls, and they gave generously out of the little that they had. This sense of fiscal responsibility carried through the, for many years to come is seen in another student's account. One Christmas, the girls set a goal of $5,290 for the Lottie Moon offering. This seemed impossible for, for girls that made 60 cents an hour. However, they began making and selling gifts, sacrificing desserts, giving money they had received from various churches where they had given their services on special occasions, etc. A sign on one door read, The Fix-It Shop, Your Haircut, Hair Set, Hems, Seams, Etc. Proceeds to Lottie Moon. It was a tense moment when the gifts were totaled, totaled and it was found that they had not given $5,290, but $6,014.54. Continuing into the years of the Depression, two more capable women were acquired to serve as superintendents of the training school. Minnie Shepard, another graduate graduate of the school. She led for a short time and she was followed by Laura Johnson. Mrs. Johnson was a merchant's wife who worked out of Roswell, New Mexico. She was involved in the New Mexico WMU and after her husband's death she moved to the seminary to teach WMU methods and to look after the welfare both physical and spiritual of those in her charge. During her years at Southwestern, 36 of her students were appointed by the Foreign Mission Board. In 1935, the faculty of the seminary decided to incorporate the missionary training classes into the regu regular seminary schedule. The missionary training degree was no longer available. Instead, most of the students would go on to get religious education degrees. The Texas WMU, as well as, other, uh, as WMUs from other states, continued to provide scholarships allowing graduates to serve in numerous different areas of ministry. Many served with their husbands as pastor's wives and denominational servants. Some went on to fulfill callings as missionaries, both home and abroad, and others served in settlement work and education. I wanted to give you a glimpse of just a little bit of what has been accomplished for the kingdom through the missionary training school. So I thought we would look at four different um, graduates and see what the Lord did with them. First was Kath, uh, Christine Coffey. Christine served as an assistant to Mrs. Cheek in Fort Worth Hall, and upon graduating, she was appointed to the Foreign Mission Board in 1913 to Canton, China. Christine learned Chinese while teaching girls and uh, teaching English in a girls' boarding school. She ran Bible studies and prayer bands among the girls, and many girls in her charge professed their faith in Christ. In 1918, Christine married a fellow missionary to China, Robert E. Chambers. The Chambers went on to work for the China Baptist Publication Society, and Christine is credited for her work in publishing the Sunday School paper Kind Words in Chinese. After Robert's death of pneumonia in 1932, Christine continued her work in China. The onset of World War II made it necessary for Christine to leave China, so she returned to the States and started a ministry working with Chinese students at the University of Michigan. Grace Tennessee Elliott graduated in 1916 and appeared before the Foreign Mission Board in 1919 for appointment to Ying Tak, China. She arrived in November of that year. She worked as the principal of the Ko Men Grammar and High School for Girls. For five years, she served at this school until she married Manly Whitfield Rankin in August of 1924. Uh, Manly was another missionary and he led the Ko Men Boys School. The Rankins remained in China until World War II, and like Christine, Grace returned to the States when the Japanese began, began fierce air raids on China. Manley stayed as long as he could, but was finally sent home by the doctors to rest because of the stress of wartime. The Rankins did return to China and were in and out of the country to help during the aftermath of the war. In 1952, uh, the Rankins were back in the United States and helped start a church in a vacant noodle factory in the Chinatown area of Los Angeles. Through 40 years, uh, 43 years of missionary service, Grace served in China, Malaysia, and Hawaii. Um, next, Essie Mae Fuller, she graduated in 1919 
and she arrived in Pernambuco, Brazil in June 1920. She ran a missionary training school for Brazilian girls. In 1925, she made a field report, report from Brazil to the Southern Baptist Convention and said, never were the challenging words, Brazil needs the living Christ, brought more forcibly to all than during the past years of revolutions, political strife, camouflage patriotism, and banditism. In all of this unrest and strife, there has been a groping after something, a yearning after Christ, who alone can give the wanted rest, though the majority of the people do not realize that it is the living Savior they seek. So you can glimpse her heart in that statement, her heart for the people of Brazil. After 12 years of working in North Brazil, Essie May moved to Sao Paulo in Southern Brazil to, to direct the Anna Bagby School, another missionary training school. It was here she met a Brazilian pastor named Severino Batista, whom she married in 1942. Because of her marriage to a national pastor, uh, she was no longer eligible to stay with the Foreign Mission Board, but she continued serving by visiting churches in the Sao Paulo area as a WMU field secretary. After the death of her husband, she returned to Georgia where she died at the age of 101. She lived a long life. And finally, we have Mary Ellen Caver. Um, Mary Ellen arrived in Nigeria, Africa, in 1925. She, was, she worked among the Dahomey people until 1929, when she returned to the states to work for the Alabama Baptist State Convention. She traveled the state leading Sunday school training. So coincidentally, this past summer, the Baptist Press published a story about Mary Ellen Caver, and it is, it's really an amazing story, so I, I thought I would share it with you. The story tells of how one Sunday in the 30s, Mary Ellen walked out of a church in South Alabama and was met by a group of black men in the parking lot. They wanted her to talk to a man from their church named Cujo, who they thought was crazy. They said he told parables and stories, spoke in an unknown language, and claimed to come from Africa. They thought she could talk to him since she had spent time in Africa. Mary Ellen explained to the men that even if the man was from Africa, the chance of chances of them speaking the same dialect were very slim, but she agreed to go see him. The day Mary Ellen arrived at Cujo's cabin, from his porch he greeted her in his native dialect. It was the dialect of the Dahomey people Mary Ellen had ministered to in Africa. When she greeted him back, he replied not to her but to God saying, I thank you Lord, I know you would. Cujo was bought, brought to Alabama on a slave ship. He was the last survivor of the last cargo of slaves captured in Africa and sold in Alabama. In America, Cujo found his greatest joy, Jesus. For decades, he served in the Union Missionary Baptist Church and prayed he would live long enough to hear that his people in Africa had heard the gospel. God had done the seemingly impossible because Mary Ellen had appeared at his gate telling him that she'd been the one to share Jesus with his people. Years later, Mary Ellen revisited Cujo's home to find a roughly made concrete headstone. Scratched into it was simply his name, the fact that he had been born in Africa, and the words, I believes in prayer. I just thought that was a super amazing story. So, um, so Dr. Scarborough said of the training school, our purpose is to do for women, women in their work what we are doing for men in theirs, give them trained workers, thus reaching the fields opening to Christian womanhood for service. 112 years later, I think he would be proud to know that we are still doing that very thing. Is it? <laughs>